Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to my channel. I am Monet and you're watching Life is Monet. Welcome to my January wrap up. So January was very much an up and down reading month for me. I had literally like excellent reads or just awful. There was really no in between and I hate that for me. It was very rocky reading month. I did not do a TBR for January. Um, I had some other just previous obligations that I needed to read in the month of January so I really stuck with those and then everything else was just mood reading, a couple of buddy reads and yeah I think I missed the structure of having my TBR as well as the excitement of just the random TBRs that I get when I do my prompt jar and so I'm very glad that I'm moving back to that in February because I don't want a repeat of January ever again. One of the first books that I finished is the part two to Lola and the Millionaires. This book literally took me like six months to finish and it's not because it was bad. It's just I read the first one which is part one on my Kindle and I flew through it and then when I picked up part two my life was just so crazy. Work was so crazy that whenever I try to read my Kindle I always save it for times where I'm like in the bed getting ready to go to sleep. That's the best time for me to do e-reading. If I am up I, I can only do audio or physical. There's just something about moving around outside of my bedroom with my Kindle that does not work for my reading. But at the end of my days when I was trying to read this book I was so incredibly tired that I just kept falling asleep. So when I finished the book I ended up giving part two four stars. I really enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed part two a little more than I enjoyed part one um, because it's a reverse harem and so some of the other characters that we really didn't get to see Lola with in part one we got to see them in part two and I really enjoyed the spice and the just strong connection between them as well as I enjoyed Lola's growth the most as well as the plot of the story the most. So I definitely feel like part two was the strongest of the two. I don't think I'll be continuing in the Sweet Omegaverse or continuing with that series. It was a fun time. I had a good time but I'm just not interested enough to keep going. Um, maybe I'll pick up The Lady of Rooksgrave Manor because I've heard really great things about that one but other than that I think I'm done. I also reread Ninth House as well as the sequel Hellbent in January. I did vlog my entire experience reading both of those books and I'll put the link to the video in the cards. You'll be able to go and get my full thoughts there. I enjoyed Ninth House the second time around. I was very scared to reread read it because I wasn't sure if it was going to hold up to my standards. The, the reader that I am today is very different than a reader I was three years ago when that book came out so I was just nervous. I'm very happy to say that I still enjoyed uh, the book the second time around. I got more takeaways away from it as well as I thought Hellbent was a very solid sequel. I think I'm in the minority now that I've seen some reviews come out for Hellbent. I think I'm very much in the minority for liking the sequel more than I liked book one. Uh, everyone that I've watched and read reviews views from have enjoyed Hellbent but it just wasn't the same as Ninth House and I think it was different for me. I really enjoyed the sequel much more. Then I read Talia Hilbert's newest release which is a YA black romance story called Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute. This book features Bradley and Celine who were best friends on the fringes of the school social circles when they were around 14 but then Bradley really changed much about his interests and his persona and that prepared him to the top of the food chain. He became very popular. He was an athlete and Celine became even more so like herself, antisocial, weird, and a bit of a staunch conspiracy theorist. Since the breakup of their friendship they have been enemies. Uh, Celine saw Bradley switch up as him being incredibly fake um, and disloyal and Bradley saw Celine being upset at him switching his interests as her being extremely controlling and him not being allowed to like anything or anyone outside of her. When an opportunity arises for a college scholarship Celine and Bradley are forced to work together and it's going to spark a lot of resolutions from their dissolved friendship as well as some romantic situations. So this book is technically childhood friends to lovers uh, but friends to enemies to lovers. Overall I thought the story was very YA age appropriate and a lot of the things that I disliked about the story I think could be easily overlooked for a YA group because they're not reading it with such a critical eye in the way that I am. Um, so I do think that it's a recommendable story especially for young readers. I also think that the fact that they have this deep uh, connection to one another, this intertwining of their families and, and this like full history really helps set up the relationship in the story. It makes it a little more believable and compelling for the reader because you're learning about their past as well as them together in the present and you're rooting for them romantically but 
nonetheless, you're also like at the bare minimum, you want to see them be friends again. So I think the investment is heightened. There's also some really great depictions around Celine and Bradley trying to take control of their lives from their parents because they're both 17. They're getting ready to go off to college and they are having to compete with their visions of their future, with the visions that their parents think they want or their parents want to see them pursue. And so there's a bit of a, of a challenging dynamic, but I really enjoyed it because they did it in a way that didn't require uh, such a breakdown in communication or a breakdown in their relationship. They were able to really get their parents to come to heal in a way that just felt appropriate for a 17 year old without it being disrespectful, um, which is something that you don't really see in YA stories that often there. It just, you see the characters get to a complete breaking point and they end up like snapping because they really can't take it anymore. Um, but I think that this book handled those things in, in, a, in a better way than I've seen so far. There were some large inconsistencies with the characters in the story for me, especially Bradley. Um, there is literally one sentence in the book where he is described as bisexual and it is never visited again. Um, and that felt like a little weird to me. Like, why would you put that there? Um, I think there's like one moment where he calls another guy cute. It just felt like a lot of the things that she put into Bradley to build up his characters, she often forgot until later in the book. And he has OCD, but I feel like that was very inconsistent throughout the story. There are some moments in the beginning of the story where he, you're made to believe that he has complete control over his OCD because he's gone to therapy, he's taking medication, he's just grown accustomed to dealing with um, things that might be triggers for him. And then he does a complete 180 regression halfway through the story and there's no explanation as to why this is happening. It honestly reads like she forgot to really show that he had OCD instead of just telling us repeatedly because we're told very often throughout the entire book but we don't really get to see those moments until the second half and it it really feels like a last ditch effort to bring cohesion to the story. I'm a part of the small group of people who did not enjoy uh get a life Chloe Brown and take a hint Danny Brown I actually think I DNF take a hit Danny Brown and so this book did not do much to uh, make me more of a Talia Hibbert fan her books and her stories just typically do not resonate with me but I love YA contemporary romances especially if it's featuring two black characters and so I was intrigued to pick it up for that I didn't dislike the story I think I gave it three out of five stars but overall like I I think I'm really done picking up more books by Talia Hibbert. I did enjoy the YA more than I did the adult. So if I was to ever pick up another book by her again, chances of it being YA are extremely high. Then for a buddy read with Jashana and Elliot Brooks, we read the entire trilogy for Mercedes Lackey's Arrows of the Queen. I think it's called Arrows of the Queen, um, Arrows Flight, and Arrows Fall, if I'm not mistaken. I really enjoyed the first book. I thought it was very strong. I was really excited to continue with the series. I felt like the sequel was very disappointing. There was a lot of meandering and just backtracking, and it was way too close to home um, to the main character, and I was really looking forward to moving away from that after book one, because book one is such uh, a character-centered story, and she's a child, and so you are stuck in her perspectives of the world um, and the location of the world that she's in. And I was really hoping that when she got a little older and she was able to leave uh, the collegium and travel and do these things that she needed to do for the queen as kind of like this herald or diplomat. I was really hoping that the sequel would show more about the world. And even though we're watching Talia travel and interact with different villages and different people, it still feels very provincial. And I was disappointed in that. I do think that the finale of the series saved it for me. Um, I still didn't love it as much as I wanted to, uh, but I wasn't as disappointed as I was from book two. So I do think I'll be picking up more books by Mercedes Lackey. I just, I feel like ugh, this had the makings of being such a strong story and after book one, it really went downhill for me and that makes me very sad. We're following Talia in book one, who is a 13 year old girl and she's being raised in this border town on the outskirts of this kingdom in a deeply patriarchal and religious community. She's often viewed as disrespectful and unconforming to what they want her to look like and just very unruly. Talia, on the other hand, really is someone who just loves stories and adventures and she dreams of one day becoming a herald, which is kind of like a queen's knight. Her family 
attempts to marry her off and she runs away and discovers a lost companion. So she feels honor bound to return the companion to the Collegium to the Queen's service and when she gets there she realizes that this companion, this horse, was not actually lost. He was out to find another herald and he has selected Talia. Not just to be any herald but to be the Queen's own herald and give direct counsel to her. And so we're watching Talia take on this mantle. We're watching her grow and learn and break down a lot of the religious prejudices that she's grown accustomed to. And if you're into those types of stories, these coming of age stories, and you're very forgiving of a series that was written in 19 like 85, I, I believe these books came out in 85, 86, and 87 or something like that. If you're understanding and forgiving of those old school fantasies like that, I highly recommend checking it out. The next book was one that I was incredibly excited to pick up because I, I got an arc of it. It sounded very interesting. I got a beautiful edition of it and I ultimately did not end up liking it as much as I thought I was going to and that is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. I think that this is a very beautiful book and I wish that I had loved it as much as I wanted to. So we're following Emily of course who is completely enamored with the allure of the folk which is basically like fades and fairies within the story. She has spent her entire academic career studying and measuring them against their lore. She's in the middle of compounding everything that's ever been known or discovered about the folk into this bind up of an encyclopedia. She travels to this small remote village. She's someone who's just very reserved and quiet. Um, she's not very social and when she does try to interact with individuals she typically ends up offending them and so her warm welcome into this town quickly dissipates. And then not soon after she arrives she is followed by her colleague and basically a pain in her rear which is going to be Wendell Bumblebee. And there is a very slow um, unorthodox romance between Emily and Wendell within the story and you're also learning more about the Fae. There's a lot of footnotes within the story and the book is told basically in journal entries from Emily and there's actual footnotes. So she's writing uh, the story as if it is actually her encyclopedia. Um, there's some inconsistencies that makes her an unreliable narrator as she comes in contact with the folk and different things happen throughout the story. The book overall is a very slow moving story. It is not action packed at all. Um, it requires a lot of patience even for the romance because I think like I had to be 60 65 percent into the book before anything even started happening with the romance so I think that this book is mostly just vibes if you're someone who likes reading about Faye um, in an academic type of way because it did read uh, very academically so if you like that check it out maybe but for me it's just all those things kept being a hindrance to me like how academic it was, how um, rigored and like structured the storytelling was, how slow moving it was. Uh, the character development also took a while for Emily to come around and start really interacting with individuals authentically. I think that yeah there's just it, there's so many things about the story that just did not work for me. Um, so I probably won't be continuing with the series. I was hoping that it would be better via audio because I read this book before it was released and so I was stuck reading it physically and I was hoping that like maybe the audio would be better but I ended up sampling it after it came out and I think that if I had listened to this book via audio I would have definitely DNF'd it. The next book I finished was Notes on an Execution which is a book that I recently acquired and I read it in the same month that I purchased it so I feel very great about that. This book follows Ansel who is a convicted serial killer that's scheduled to die in the next 12 hours. The book hops around from Ansel's perspective as he contemplates his fate as well well as three past perspectives of different women who knew Ansel at different but pivotal moments in his life. I think that the author does a good job of helping the readers understand Ansel and explaining the things that happened to him that later shaped who he was and the decisions that he made without trying to justify them or excuse his actions in any way. I think that Ansel is a bit of a contradiction because a lot of the things that he sees as shaping his life comes down to his perception and how he saw things play out whether or not that's actually what happened. Um, so this book does a lot on playing on nature versus nurture or 
what you think about something versus the reality of it. And ultimately just if there can ever be a justifiable reason behind the heinous actions and crimes of an individual. So the book is definitely very slow. It's very reflective. Um, it's a lot of internal dialogue between all the characters that we're following. I think that the reading experience is contradictory as well because Ansel is someone who doesn't invoke a lot of sympathy or empathy on the readers we have. Um, you don't feel bad for him, especially when you're in his head and reading his dialogue, but you do feel bad for the situations that he was placed in um, as a child where he really didn't have a say so over what was going on in his life. But also I think that the author just kind of points out that like does does that matter right? It, did this shape Ansel later on in life? So it was definitely a very interesting reading experience but I think that at the end of the day none of the questions that you think are important enough to dwell on are actually that important. The next book I read was also a buddy read and that is going to be Age of Myth by Michael J. Sullivan. They this is one that I read physically and I ended up annotating quite a lot. I was so excited to start this series this year. I plan to read one book a month and so I'm really looking forward to finishing this by the summertime of this year. This is the prequel to Rayera Revelations. We are setting up the world of Elan um, and the history as we know it or what it will come to be in the later book. So I've already read some stories within this world. You do not need to read the Michael J. Sullivan series in any orders uh, because they don't really spoil for each other. So you don't have to start with Rayera Revelations. You can jump here if you would like. This book starts off with a human character killing a Frey, which is a big deal because humans believe that Freys are God and that they cannot be killed. Um, and so they're learning about the fatality and just mortality of the Frey that they never knew existed. Existed, and this sparks an oncoming war because the Frey feel the need to retaliate against one of their own suffering at the hands of a human. I do think that this book is very different from the Rayer Revelations. I'm reading them at a slower pace so uh, there's a lot of just reservations that I have that I don't want to judge the book or the series too harshly until I see it all play out because I know enough about Michael J. Sullivan's writing to know that um, he writes his series from beginning to end before publication. So when books are being published he has already written the entire story and so that makes me have a little more faith and patience in his storytelling um, to know that there's a reason for everything that's happening in the story because of the way that he writes his books. I do like miss the just camaraderie that I had with Hadrian and Royce in Ryder Revelation. Because when you get to Theft of Swords, Hadrian and Royce have already been together for decades. They've already been best friends for decades. And so there's just this natural, easy, um, ongoing dialogue between the two of them that the reader just needs to jump into. I didn't realize how much I appreciated that until I got to this book because all of the important players in the game in this story, they have to come together and meet and get to know one another. Um, and they're learning about each other in the same way that I am and so that's not necessarily a bad thing that's typically how stories go but it just it really made me miss Hadrian and Royce because um the the banter and just the humor was there there is a lot of Michael J Sullivan humor within this book um but I don't find that it landed the same way and I was looking forward to that. I also don't think that the plot device that kicks off the story is as explosive as it was in Theft of Swords and so it's really hard for me to not judge this book based on what I've already read so far and absolutely loved. I do not think that this is a bad installation into a into a series at all. Um, so I am, like I said, withholding a lot of my thoughts to give him time to tell the story because like I know that he has the capacity to blow my mind. And I've heard people say that they really love this, that they even love it more than the other series that he's written. So I will come back with better, more comprehensive thoughts once I read like the second book or maybe the third book uh, since that's the end of the first arc so that I can really know where I stand on the series. Then I tried to read Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen and whew, I DNF that book so quickly. I do not understand like after reading Pride and Prejudice why there was a need to retell the story that's going to have the same takeaways. Like a lot of the the commentary on the society and the structure and what was expected of women and what women looked for in a marriage and relationship. Like all of those things had already been explored in Pride and Prejudice. And I know that Sense of Sensibility is a follow-up. It's a sequel. Um, that should have been my red flag not to pick it up because I don't think that I needed that. I found this to be deadly boring. 
my goodness. The next book that I finished was Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson. I have had four of her books sitting on my shelf for literal years and I was getting to the point where I was like Monet you need to unhaul them because like at this point you're never gonna read them but I am happy to say that this is the third one out of four that I have read and so I feel very good about that. I think that Tiffany D. Jackson is well warranted in writing YA thrillers in the way that she does especially featuring black characters. She deserves all the recognition that she gets. This book is following Enchanted who really wants to be a singer and her parents are very apprehensive around that. They want her to focus on school to pursue other things and keep singing as kind of like this side hobby. But during an audition Enchanted comes in contact with Corey Fields who is this big well-known artist who is way older than she is and they have this relationship that kicks off that no one knows about. Her parents thinks that Corey is just helping Enchanted record kind of like an EP um, to kickstart her career but he is definitely preying on her in a predatory way and using his power, his money, his status, and his influence to create this very unequal power dynamic of relationship between them. You do learn from the synopsis that whatever's going to happen in this book will lead to the death of Corey Fields and so the mystery is already set up from the beginning of learning how you're going to get to that point and what's going to happen between Corey and Enchanted to get you there. At this point I have read Allegedly, I have read Monday's Not Coming and I've also read Grown and I think that this is the strongest story that I've seen Tiffany write so far. It's not the most interesting in terms of the plot. I do think that Allegedly or Monday's Not Coming intrigues the reader. Money's Not Coming specifically is a very compulsive read because you feel the need to just keep reading throughout the story and the chapters are just short enough to keep you going and you feel the need to find out what happened to Monday as soon as you can. I don't think that the same hunger is there uh, with this book because you're you're not sympathizing with Corey. He's a very predatory person. He is essentially a pedophile and so you don't really have the same interest in finding out what's going to happen to him. And so you just don't have the same interest or investment in him. Um, I think that allegedly covers a lot of great topics as well but I think that as far as the twist in this book it is the the best executed that I've seen her do so far. I am very satisfied with my read. I gave this book four out of five stars but after this one I'm definitely coming to understand why Tiffany has as much hype around her name as she does. I don't think I'll be reading everything that she puts out or everything that she writes. I've read enough to recognize what I think I'll like from her and what I should probably not even bother picking up. The last book that I own is Let Me Hear a Rhyme so hopefully I can pick that book up before this year is out and I can be done with my physical TBR of books by Tiffany D. Jackson. And then <laughs> I tried to read Magnolia Parks. Um, I DNF this book at 70% in. I don't have anything nice to say. I no longer trust the book community because this was absolute ass and I can't believe the hype that this book is getting. This is essentially a Gossip girl s type story with Magnolia and BJ. They dated for a long time from their childhood up until uh, like right in college before BJ actually cheated on Magnolia. And when we start the story, Story. they have been separated for three years but they have a very toxic codependency on one another where they are they feel the need to be uh in each other's proximity a lot but they don't allow each other to touch or kiss they sleep in the same bed but they're also still not touching at this point as well and BJ is having sex with literally anything that will move to cope with him not being with Magnolia and Magnolia who doesn't want to go running back to the guy who broke her heart is getting different boyfriends as a beard to kind of put up this quasi barrier between her and BJ but most of these boyfriends are aware that she is just using them as a placeholder because she is very openly flaunting BJ and their interactions with one another in front of all these boyfriends. In addition to that they are well known within London society and so paparazzi is constantly printing about them in the tabloids um, so that's kind of like where the gossip girl kind of component comes in. I thought that this book was fucking stupid. I truly did. It was for the first 70%, which is where I stopped, but 70% is a lot of, of the book. And 70%, we start off the book with Magnolia having a boyfriend that she breaks up with. And her and BJ are trying to work it out. They might get together. But then she and him get into a small debacle and then 
he goes out and has sex with someone and does some coke. She sees him have sex. She gets a boyfriend. And she's with this boyfriend and he sees her with the boyfriend. So he goes and has sex with 12 and 15 more people and does 12 more lines of coke. It's a consistent like limbo that they're stuck in. And I, first of all, did not think that they belonged together. I thought that BJ had the emotional intelligence of a bop it and that he was childish incredibly childish and there was nothing attractive about BJ in the slightest like we get his POV and I would I was literally wondering the entire time like why like what is it about BJ that's attractive to anyone to the author who wrote him to Magnolia herself to the readers who read the book I need someone to highlight one thing about BJ one pro because all I have is a list of cons so I never wanted them to be together but then after watching them go through complete childish circles with one another I became disgusted like literally my my stomach was hurting and I was like disgusted watching them interact with one another because I've never come across two individuals that like don't need to be anywhere near each other like I need one of them to pick up and move to fucking Australia to get that far away from the other person because this is this is stomach turning the shit that's happening in this book like this is not a romance at all and yeah I just I couldn't do it anymore on top of that the writing was awful the writing was awful typos left and right prepositions she don't know them she ain't never met them subject verb predicate doesn't make sense to her foreign language the book was awful and so I I had to jump off that train um yeah yeah I'm I'm really trying with the romance community I'm really trying to understand the romance girlies but y'all you keep losing me. You, you really keep losing me. It is getting down to the wire on just romance book recommendations that I will take from certain individuals. Like the list, the list is getting shorter and shorter. I'm starting to cross out names from any time I'm led astray. I'm so sorry. The second to last book that I finished in January is The Daughters of Ishtahar. This is a new release that's set in this modern quasi-Egyptian style country. Our main characters are Nial and Georgina and they both have elemental magic which is very much like Avatar The Last Airbender. One of them is an earthbender or like I can't think of what it's called. It's not earthbender but is earth something. Weavers, that's what they're called. Um, one of them is a water weaver and the other is an earth weaver, which is really like a water bender and an earth bender, same thing. Nihal is the daughter of an aristocrat who has tried to marry her off to settle her debts, but she wants to go to the academy and learn to serve in the country's army. And so she sets a deal with her new fiance that he can take a concubine, which would be Georgina, and that's the person he's actually in love with, if he signs off for her to go to the academy. Georgina, on the other hand, is not the daughter of an aristocrat. She has every reason to protect her family's reputation as well as her own. And so she wants more out of life than being a concubine. And so she turns him down. She is an earth weaver. Both of them are incredibly powerful. They get caught up in this radical group called the Daughters of Ishtahar, who are pursuing a political movement to bring voting rights to the women in the country. And for one reason or another, they both kind of get caught up in this and find themselves fighting for the same reasons to have control over their own lives. However, some of the choices that they make will bring their country to the brink of war. This was a solid introduction to a new fantasy. I think that there's some very strong components to the story. I will be continuing with the sequel because it's a duology and so I feel like the investment on my behalf is there since there's only two books. It is a very heavy-handed book. The commentary and the dialogue that's happening with the women and the plights that they're going through, the political messaging in the story is very heavy-handed and so it feels grounded in a, in a realistic way that if you're someone who wants to read about escapism or wants escapism in your fantasies or you don't want your authors to be so uh, on the nose with their messaging, I do think that this book will be hard to swallow because it is incredibly like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer with the messaging around women and a patriarchal society and a religious society and them trying to fight for control of things and the pushback that you get of that. It, it felt so realistic, so real world today in a lot of ways. Um, but for me, I don't mind that. That's not a turnoff for me. I don't 
mind a heavy-handed messaging. I just don't like being guided. That's the thing that's like, you have to balance that. Like, don't push me in one direction or another, but you can scream your message from the rooftops. You can be as loud as you want with your message. Just don't, don't push me. Um, so yeah, this book managed to balance that in a, in an odd way, which is talent to the writer itself. So I will be checking out the sequel. The last book that I finished in January was The Last Tale of the Flower Bride. This edition of this book is so freaking beautiful. This book has a bit of a dual perspective. We're following the bridegroom of whom we never really get his name. He is enraptured with folklore and fairy tales and he sets out to look at this artifact that is owned by this very rich and powerful person by the name of Indigo and him and Indigo have this whirlwind of a romance and they find themselves almost immediately married and falling in love with one another but Indigo only has one request and that's that the bridegroom should never look into her past and never ask any questions which he thinks he's perfectly fine doing because he's literally under a spell binding love with Indigo. However a few years into their marriage Indigo gets a call that her aunt is dying and they have to travel back to Indigo's mansion where she grew up which is very much alive and with magic. The house is an entire entity in and of itself. When they arrive at Indigo's childhood home the house is trying to tell the bridegroom a message. Her dying aunt is trying to tell the bridegroom a message as well as there's a promise of an answer to a question that he's been asking his entire life which is what happened to his little brother when he was growing up. And so all of these things contribute to the bridegroom finally looking behind the veil and into the past of Indigo that he promised that he never would and it may cause the foundation of their entire marriage to collapse. This book is very much a fever dream type story. It requires you to suspend a heavy amount of disbelief because if you look at the story logically there's just so many holes that are woven throughout the story that just doesn't make sense but I also think that that's required to tell a story like this because you never know what is metaphorical or what is literal if he really is under a spell from indigo or if it just feels like that you don't know if magic is really real or if they're suffering from mental illnesses like there's just so many things to the story that like you have to keep a very open mind. I do think that the writing was fantastic the writing was stunning and I am very shocked because I've seen this author's name everywhere and I've heard her books raved about very often but I've never heard anybody really talk about her writing but this was like some Lainey Taylor, Erin Morgenstern type writing, Bridget Collins type writing and I was not expecting that so I was already in love from there. I found that picking up this book every once in a while and getting just immersed within the story and like going through the fever dream was very comfortable for me and so I went through it no thoughts head empty and it was very very enjoyable. Sometimes I want books to just pick me up and sweep me away and like me not to look at it very critically and this one was definitely one that I would describe as like eerie, um, very cunning, very spellbinding and it's, it's one that requires you not to look too closely otherwise you'll break the spell and that's probably an allegory for what the bridegroom does with his marriage in the book. And those are all the books that I read in the month of January. Comment down below some books that you read as well as some books you'll be picking up and checking out because of my review here. As always thank you for watching my channel and I will see you guys next time.